I would um, like to thank Alina, Michael, and uh, Philip uh, for inviting me to give a talk um, in this seminar, and uh, I guess more than anything else for really organizing and running this seminar, which has been a great resource for the number theory community. Um, and also thank you all for coming here to uh, spend part of your Thursday with us. Um, so I'll speak on this, um, on Beyond the Spherical Soup Norm Problem, which is on work joint with my uh, dear colleagues, uh, Valentin Blomer, Gergo Hartzosh, and Peter Maga. Um, so I promise the talk will end up being about automorphic forms and number theory, but I'll start kind of with um, some amount of um, uh, inspiration from analysis. Um, so, so our setting here is that, let's say we have a compact Riemannian manifold X, and uh, one of the ideas in global analysis is that um, you can encode the geometry of this manifold X with a special differential operator, which is of second order, and it's known as the Laplacian uh, delta on this manifold X. Uh, so for example, like the standard thing that we see in multivariable calculus is um, if you have some sort of a surface, which is maybe a quotient of R2, um, you might be looking at the standard Euclidean Laplacian, um, which is the thing we love uh, from calculus, del squared by del x squared plus del squared plus del y squared. All right. And so the building blocks of, of analysis on this, on this manifold uh, are the eigenfunctions uh, of this Laplacian operator. Um, and uh, so this is this is the they satisfy the equation that delta f is minus lambda f, and I will always normalize my eigenfunctions to be L two norm one in this talk. Um, and so the super norm problem is really one of my favorite questions in math, um, and it really asks if you um, if you normalize your uh, eigenform to be L two norm one, uh, so it has a certain mass and it's somehow distributed around your manifold, and you could ask somehow how are these values distributed in particular. How much can they concentrate, let's say, at a single point, right? And in that case, you're really asking how large can be the pointwise values of this function um, be. And so, um, so you're really asking basically about the soup norm, about the maximum of this function over the whole manifold. And um, you might want to ask what is the correct scale on which to ask this question. Um, so you can imagine that as this lambda, this lambda is known in physics as the energy of your eigenstate. As this energy becomes higher and higher, you get these eigenfunctions that are somehow wavier and wavier. And you could imagine that this maximum could actually start growing with lambda. And um, it turns out that for the baseline question, the correct scale is the power scale. So you could be asking somehow, uh, how big does this soup norm get as the power, as a power of the Laplacian eigenvalue lambda? All right. So, um, so this problem has uh, has various sources of intuition where you can kind of start guessing what might be the right answer. Um, and in particular, uh, there is geometric intuition that comes from the fact that the very definition of the Laplacian involves averages over small balls. Like if you go back to the definition, really, really what it does is it, it asks somehow, if you look at the average of your function over small ball, you're asking how much does that deviate from the central value. Right? And because this involves averages over small balls in X, that means that this operator somehow encodes the geometry, the geometry of X, right? And this, is, this leads to the famous um, question in spectral geometry, which is like, can you hear the shape of the drum? Uh, like if you have uh, information about, if you have spectral information about the eigenfunctions, can you recover geometric information about your manifold? Uh, George, there's a, there's a hand raised in the chat, uh, yeah, Christopher. Ahead. Yeah, yes, um, it's um, so you're asking about the soup norm. So I assume that the so the eigenfunctions will necessarily be continuous. Yes, yes probably C infinity. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thanks. All right. Um, and so again, uh, this this operator sees uh, sees basically how the balls are expanding, and so it basically encodes how the geodesic flow is running on your manifold. Uh, so from the quantum mechanical perspective, what this operator is doing is it's quantizing the geodesic flow. Its eigenfunctions are really eigenstates. The, they're pure eigenstates um, of the quantized system. And so we have this correspondence principle, well, like you can ask physicists what this should do. And uh, basically the, the little dictionary that I want to share here is that somehow in, in the classical mechanics, that's what's on the left side of this slide, you can think about classical particles moving in space or following the geodesic flow. Um, and on the quantum side, what corresponds to this is a discrete set of eigenstates. You have a discrete set with increasing uh, energy levels. 
Um, and then the idea is that the long-term evolution of your um, of your classical mechanical system should be should be encoded in the high energy eigenstates when lambda goes um, lambda goes to infinity. Um, really, this corresponds to the semi-classical limit um, that physicists uh, look at, like where the parameter h bar is going to zero. If you know what that means. Um, and then the idea is that also the geometry should be somehow reflected. So, for example, if you have a stable closed orbit on your manifold, then that ends up being reflected um, in a sequence of eigenstates which concentrate around your around your closed orbit. So if you look at high energy eigenstates, you would be able to recognize some of the geometry of X, right? Um, now, on the other hand, uh, I said, this last thing that I said was about stable closed orbits, right? But if you look at on a negatively curved manifold, then you expect a more diffused picture. Um, for example, the, the classical geodesic flow is, is ergodic, it's strongly mixing. Um, so you wouldn't really expect to see terribly pronounced um, uh, features um, in the, on, on the quantum on the quantum side. And so, for example, uh, if you look at the hyperbolic surfaces, these are the surfaces that we really like in uh, automorphic forms. So these are the quotients of the hyperbolic upper half plane by, uh, let's say, discrete subgroup gamma, uh, maybe finite covolume. Um, then we have this generic bound, and the, the generic bound uh, ends up being lambda to one quarter. Okay, so this this sees nothing except uh, just the local geometry of your manifold, um, and the idea is that because there's this strong mixing on the classical mechanical side, um, uh, you should not be able to concentrate quite this much. And so the subconvexity problem in this setting asks for a bond that saves a little bit of, over one quarter um, in the in the exponent for the sup norm. All right. So <clears throat> so if you don't know what to expect if you don't know what the truth is, then you can always ask your computer to do some computations and to look at some eigenfunctions, right? Um, the computer or other pieces of equipment. So maybe I would just want to share a few pictures. Um, so this is this is an actual picture that was made uh, under a low temperature microscope. Uh, apparently, um, there are forty eight um, iron atoms that have been precisely arranged, and then. Um, and then they were they were imaging this with the microscope and they colored the picture so that we can actually see what's going on. This is this is an exhibit um, in Alexandria and it was done in in uh, IBM laboratories. So this is fascinating, like where you can actually see this uh, you can see this concentration happening along um, a specific uh, geometric shape. Uh, these are known as whispering gallery effects, um, or maybe more so in a in a more mathematical setting, so people look at billiards. So these are billiards in the in the usual uh, plane, um, and you you impose a boundary problem and you you ask for um, you ask for eigenfunctions. So a computer can compute this for you. And here, your pictures of some of these eigenfunctions. And the striking thing that you can't not see. Uh, I mean, I mean, you see this and kind of like there's there's this immediate view of, for example, this closed orbit here. So this is a periodic. Uh, closed orbit of the geodesic flow. If you hit the billiard ball, it really will bounce around here. And what you're seeing here is that is that eigenfunctions are picking up on that, right? Um, so you can see eigenfunctions that pick up kind of more and more complicated orbits as you as you go into higher and higher energy levels. All right. Or maybe another picture that I want to share is this is actually just the this is a different geometry. This is a geometry on the positively curved sphere. Um, and um, what I'm asking for here is these are really degree 11 spherical harmonics um, on this sphere. There are 12 of them. Um, there are typical zonal spherical harmonics. And what you can see is that um, <clears throat> there's a standard numbering schemes for these. And um, you can actually see that there are these that concentrate just around the pole. Uh, and then somehow as you go through the numbering scheme that kind of dissipates a little bit, you can still see lots of concentration uh, and by the time you get to the other end of the numbering scheme, you get these eigenfunctions that concentrate around the equator of the sphere. All right, so eigenfunctions can look very, very differently depending on the geometry that you're dealing with um, in the underlying manner. All right, so I want to talk about- Maybe there's a uh, question in the chat uh, regarding yes, is... um, the locus um, of maximal modulus or versus the locus of zeros. Would that, which one of those corresponds to the uh, closed ge geodesics in these pictures? In these pictures, it's maximum modulus. So all these pictures are about are about the size of the of the eigenfunction. Yeah. All right. So 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 yes, no, these are these are not nodal. These are not nodal lines. What I was showing. All right. So um, 
so this is a very difficult problem in general in analysis, especially in the negatively curved case. Um, and in the negatively curved case, all non-trivial improvements beyond maybe, we can save maybe a log or something like that um, with analytic techniques, but all power saving improvements that we have are for arithmetic manifolds. And these are, these are interesting because they give you access to, to Hecke correspondences. Um, and we look at eigenfunctions that are not just eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, but really eigenfunctions of the whole family of the Laplacian and all the correspondences, and those are basically automorphic forms. Um, so for example, if you look at mass forms on the on, on arithmetic quotients of the upper half plane, then we have this uh, famous band of Ivanets and Sarnak, which really started this subject. Um, and it saves from one quarter, one quarter is six over 24, and it saves down to five over 24 um, in the exponent. Um, and uh, I would say more generally, um, instead of thinking about this as quotients of the upper half plane, you can think about this as uh, like the upper half plane, of course, is the quotient of G mod K, where G is SL2R. Um, and you can think about uh, these estimates uh, more generally with much more general uh, groups G. So there are results of uh, Blomet and Maga for SL and R, um, my own results with Blomet and Hartzosh and Maga uh, that kind of cover the GL2R setting. and and there's a well-known uh, paper of Marshall that covers a wide class of Lie groups. All right, uh, maybe as another example, uh, I just wanna say this is also classical. These are holomorphic forms of high uh, weight, um, high weight K. Um, and in that case, of course, F of Z itself, um, somehow it really does have to be multiplied by Y to K over two uh, so that it becomes genuinely, um, genuinely invariant. And when you look at the supernorm of this, it turns out that uh, so k to one half is a trivial bound, and you can actually get very very strong savings down to k to one quarter. Uh, so you can get square root um, uh, square root savings over the, the local geometric bound in this setting. All right. So uh, so these are classical. What I want to say here is that um, you can kind of I want to put a different spin on this problem. Um, uh, Okay, sorry, before I say that, I should say you can also, there, there's many other questions you can ask. You can ask these questions in the level aspect where you're looking at the covers of your surface, or you can look for hybrid bonds, et cetera. So people have done this. And I really want to kind of start thinking about this problem a little differently. So, so what I wanna say is that you can look at mass forms and holomorphic forms uh, for an arithmetic group gamma. So maybe gamma is SL2Z, think about it like that. Um, I can think about these really as arising from representations of SL2R. And representations of SL2R come uh, basically in two flavors. There are principal series representations. Um, they correspond to mass forms. Um, and then there are discrete series representations and they give rise to, um, to holomorphic forms. So the, the, the first point I want to raise here is that actually uh, both of these types of representations, they occur in literally the same decomposition of the same space of L2 of G mod gamma, where G is now the whole group SL2R. So, so if you don't insist on, on looking at G mod K mod gamma, uh, then you will pick up not just the spherical forms, which are which correspond to principal series representations, but you will also pick up the discrete series representations and they will all, all occur in the same decomposition of L2 of G mod gamma. So what we're trying to do in, um, in this uh, paper is that we're trying to kind of switch the perspective on the soup norm problem um, and to start thinking about it on the on the level of the group. All right, so, so maybe for that, um, I wanna start thinking about a similar picture where I, I look at the group quotient G mod gamma and the group G is maybe a little more, has a more rich representation theory than just SL2R. Um, and so we're gonna be working with the group SL2C and I'll review that representation theory for you. So first you have to look at the maximal compact. The maximal compact is SU2. And the kind of the big new thing here is that this maximal compact is non-abelian. Uh, so because it's non-abelian, it's um, so unlike, so for SO2R, the maximal compact is SO2. And so, so the, the irreps are just characters, but here you're actually gonna pick up kind of genuine finite dimensional representation. Um, so for every, uh, for every half, sorry, for every half, uh, half integer L, non-negative, um, you will pick up one, um, uh, two L plus one dimensional representation that we call tau sub L. Um, and that's basically all. That's, that's, the, that's the full enumeration of uh, irreducible representations of SU2. And then when you look at the representations of SL2C, other than the trivial one, 
um, they are all actually principal series representations. Um, and they are induced from a character uh, on the Borel subgroup. Uh, so maybe you look at the standard Borel subgroup, um, the elements of the diagonal are Z and Z inverse. And what this character does is uh, because Z is a non-zero complex number, uh, it will have a modulus and it will have um, kind of the compact part. Uh, the modulus you can raise to a continuous parameter nu um, and the compact part you can raise to, um, to a half integer. Um, and from each of those uh, characters, you can induce to the full group and get a principal series representation. I see that there's something happening in the chat or should we? No, okay, good. Okay, so so after I've enumerated um, after I've enumerated all of these representations of SL2C, then I can ask the basic question of automorphic forms, which is that um, I give myself uh, maybe an arithmetic subgroup gamma. I look at the space L2 of G mod gamma and I ask which representations occur there. It turns out that only the unitary representations can occur. I mean, kind of like, of course, because it's the L2 space. Um, and these unitary representations can be fully classified. So uh, there will be princip tempered principal series representations and this new uh, must actually lie on this tempered axis, IR. Uh, there will be complementary series representations which occur only when P is zero. So this is like the uh, kind of like, um, okay, there is no compact part really here and nu must be between zero and one. Um, so this is somewhat parallel to the complementary series representations for SL2R. These are your forms that violate the Ramanujan conjecture, um, the Selberg Ramanujan conjecture. And then finally, um, all of these uh, representations pi nu p that I just listed, they are all irreducible and distinct, except that there's this quote unquote obvious um, equivalence between pi nu p and pi minus nu minus p, which is fairly obvious from just looking at what they're induced from. All right, so, um, so once I look at one of these representations, what does it look like? Um, so I have this uh, representation space v nu p, this is the induced representation space um, and um, and I can ask for it with respect to the action of, of this compact subgroup K. Uh, so it will decompose into a sum of irreducibles. Um, and so what I, the way it ends up looking like, remember these representations of K, they are these tau sub Ls, they're indexed by this parameter L. And what ends up happening is that only parameters L that start at absolute value of P and up uh, keep occurring. And basically for each of those, um, for each of those K types, starting at P and up, uh, it will occur exactly once uh, in this induced representation. Um, and then in turn, this V sub L is a two L plus one dimensional representation and it can be further decomposed with respect to the action of this compact diagonal subgroup. Uh, so this M uh, is, uh, is the compact part of the, of the diagonal subgroup. Um, and of course uh, there, the representations are just characters and you can decompose this two L plus one dimensional representation into a direct sum of one dimensional representations VLQ. So these VLQ are one dimensional. Um, so you can ask for what they are spanned by. So these are the forms that we call phi LQ and you can normalize them to be L2 norm one. So physicists call this the Wigner basis um, of, your, um, of your representation VL. All right, good. So this is the representation theory of SL2C. So this is what a principal series representation looks like. Um, and it, so basically it starts from these lowest weight vectors when L is equal to P and then you, you start going up. This is similar to mass forms on SL2R. When you look at mass forms on SL2R, you start from lowest weight vectors. These are weight zero vectors and then they keep going up. When you look at holomorphic forms like that come from discrete series representation, the lowest weight vectors are weight K and then they start going up. All right, um, so, 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 so after I gave you this kind of quick overview of the representation theory, I want to say one particular type of representations are those when P is zero. So when P is zero, then you will see the lowest K type. Uh, the K type when L equals zero, zero will occur. And that's exactly when your representation contains K invariant vectors. And these K invariant vectors actually live on the quotient H3 mod gamma. So these are the mass forms on arithmetic hyperbolic three manifolds, right? And for example, you could look at gamma could be, for example, SL2 of Z of I. That's the group we take in our work. Um, and in that case, this quotient, this is just this is just the Bianchi orbifold that corresponds to the Gaussian integers. All right. Um, but beyond this, and and maybe I should say for spherical mass forms, the soup norm is uh, well understood, partly uh, by kind of the same group of people. 
Um, uh, so, so Blomer Hartzosh and I worked on that before. Um, but I do want to say that the supernormal problem makes sense not just on this uh, portion of the upper half space, or uh, if you will, on, not just on the symmetric space, but it makes sense on the, on the level of the group quotient. So you really can think about the supernormal problem just for eigenforms on G mod gamma. And so, so at that point, you get a more general non-spherical supernormal problem, um, which is to estimate the supernormal problem of these eigenforms phi sub LQ, uh, which are normalized to L2 norm one. Um, or in general, you can look at these vector valued forms um, where you group um, where you group a single K type together, right? And you can ask uh, for the, um, you can think about this phi sub L as the L2 norm um, uh, of that vector. And you can ask for the sup norm of phi sub L over the whole um, manifold. <clears throat> All right, so uh, so here, because we're kind of opening a new problem, so this is a new problem. This is a problem that hasn't been discussed before. Uh, it's a problem where you're trying to estimate the supernorm of things that don't live on the symmetric space. They, look, they live on the group quotient. And so somehow the new aspect here is to think about this the case when this P is large. So P equals zero is the spherical case. So we wanted kind of a very clean situation. We wanted a clean new situation. and so. So what we're gonna what we're doing here is we're taking a large P. So we're taking something that's kind of that, that has a really high dimensional lowest weight vector, um, and 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 then we kind of uh, then we keep the the continuous parameter bounded, right? So we're not we're not interested in what happens when the continuous parameter is large, which would be kind of like which used to be the large eigenvalue aspect. We're kind of trying to minimize the impact of this and really ask about what happens when you when you increase the dimension of the k-type in the supernormal problem. Okay, and so just for comparison, I want to say here are kind of the most optimistic baseline estimates here. Uh, there's nothing obvious about these, uh, so nothing like this was known, or I should say nothing like this was actually um, easy. So I kind of hesitate to call these trivial bounds. Uh, they were not trivial for us, especially not the second one. Um, <clears throat> but basically, uh, I will show you a little bit later what kind of machinery you can use to try to estimate these supernorms. And you will see that if you don't input any uh, any arithmetic input, then these are kind of the baseline estimates. So, so for the vector valued form, the, the best estimate is L to three halves. Um, and then for the scalar valued forms, um, you can expect L, right? Um, so again, to be compared with the spherical supernormal problem where this might be like some kind of a power of the eigenvalue or of the level, right? So here we're asking on a power scale from the dimension what's happening. And so then I can actually uh, go ahead and state um, our theorems. Um, so here is the first theorem that was in our paper was that um, again, if you fix uh, if you fix an interval uh, for your continuous parameter. Sorry, and can ask, I ask a question? Yes, Peter. absolutely. I, no, um, hi. Hi. Uh, would you call that? I mean, it's not uh, trivial or not. It is. Uh, you can interpret it as a local bound, right? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, that's all I must. Okay, thanks. Uh, I will say later it, it comes from the pretrace formula formalism. Uh, so, all right. So, uh, <clears throat> so going back to here in this theorem uh, again, we're really kind of interested in what happens for the large dimension. We're keeping the continuous parameter bounded. The baseline bound was L to three halves, and we managed to to knock it down to L to four thirds plus epsilon. Uh, and here, when we talk about supernorms, we are restricting this to a compact part of the domain. So we are not uh, we are not presently thinking about what happens uh, high into the cusp, where some sometimes analytic phenomena can happen high into the cusp and we're staying away from that. All right, um, so the second theorem is um, what happens when you actually look at these scalar valid forms. This turns out to be much more delicate, um, somehow in a totally different universe of difficulty. Um, and so we were able to prove that um, if we look at these scalar valued forms in the Vignier basis, uh, phi LQ, um, and we look at the largest one of them when Q is up to L, we were able to save from L down to L to 26 over 27. Um, the precise exponent, there is nothing magical about it, but the point is that there is savings over, um, over L. And then we actually uh, tried, uh, tried hard to see uh, what kinds of estimates can we get um, for different special values of this parameter Q. Because uh, if you think back to the picture of the spherical harmonics that I showed you at the beginning, 
um, basically these uh, this parameter q indicates um, indicates along the compact how your form will behave. Um, and the behavior along the compact is going to be very, very different depending on what value of Q you choose. And so what we found is that uh, for Q equal to zero, we were able to improve our estimate to L to seven over eight. So that's that's about three times better savings than what we get for a generic Q. Um, and then actually we get a very, very strong saving when Q is plus minus L. And there we were able to save a square root. So, so, so our upper bound is L to one half. Uh, up to an epsilon. All right, so those are the three main results. Um, I'll pause for questions. Okay, so seeing none. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Is is it? What are the assumptions? Uh, um, Heka. Yes. Okay. Yes, and gamma is SL two Z of I. We just stuck to that subgroup. Uh, I have a question. Yes. You said use a pre-trace formula, right? Uh, so no spectrum other than the bottom one right, is involved. Um, when you say bottom, I mean, new. you cannot take okay, new to zero. Uh, I'm okay. taking new in a, in, a, in a short interval, let's say length one. I mean, so, so you, you essentially use, use uh, group action pre-trace without... Uh, Special resolution of Laplacian. Well, it's it's coming up. I'll I'll explain. Yeah, I mean this. Of course, you have to use arithmetic eventually. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's involved already in the structure of your phi itself, right? So you don't need to probably say it twice. I don't know. Whatever. Let's see. Okay. Good. Okay. So um. So the basic the basic setup here is somewhat classical, uh, and I will just write it, um mostly in classical language. So the way we get uh, we, the way we get a handle on these pointwise values is by this pretrace formula. So what you do is you feed it, let's say a compactly supported function f or something closely with maybe almost compactly supported function f uh, on the group. Um, and you automorphize it by by summing over all um, you automorphize this this kernel. Uh, by summing over all uh, gamma and gamma, and what ends up happening is that this will um, this will be uh, this will be gamma invariant, so it will have um, an expansion uh, in terms of an orthonormal basis of the L two space on G mod gamma. And uh, and after you kind of go through the motions, you find that you will get the pointwise values of phi at this point G. The point G is the point G that's appearing on the geometric side. Um, so you're going to get the handle on those pointwise values, and they will be weighted by a certain spherical transform of this function f that you feed into the pretrace formula. So this is the spherical transform f hat of phi. And your classical spherical soup norm problem, this would be the selberg harishchandra transform that we all know and love. All right, so the first setup, um, the first step in this setup, if you want to do anything, is that you have to understand this spherical, uh, spherical transform or spherical inversion. So there's this transform that takes a function f and it sends out uh, this, this function that I might start calling h of phi, because the way you want to use this formula is that you want to prescribe your h of phi so as to emphasize your chosen form phi. You're trying to get a handle on phi of g squared, so you want h of phi to be large around your chosen form. Um, and then once you kind of emphasize your form phi as much as you can, then you look at the geometric side and you kind of want to understand according to this function f um, what's happening on the geometric side. Uh, and so at best, what you can hope to achieve in this kind of a setup is that you can try to have on the geometric side, you can try to have that only uh, the identity term dominates. Um, and then on the spectral side, what you can hope is that you can isolate your form phi um, where you can isolate this discrete parameter p maybe to be um, at plus minus L or close to that. Um, and you can hope to isolate new in an interval of size roughly one. And you can't do better than that because of the uncertainty principle. Uh, basically, if you try to isolate your phi better, you will pay a huge price on the geometric side. Uh, and so uh, if you are able to do all of that, then this leads, this yields the local geometric bound. Uh, and that's exactly the bound that I was uh, that I was mentioning earlier. Basically, there are approximately L squared representations in this in this scenario. Um, that's the Poincaré density. So Poincaré density is L squared. Uh, the interval is of size one, um, 
And so you will pick up L squared representations, and then you, by the time you take the square root, that's the L that you get for the scalar valued functions, if you are able to execute all of this. All right. Um, uh, now, as I said, in order to improve on this, you actually need some arithmetic, and this is this is the first idea that goes back to Ivan and Sarnak, is that you want to use what we call the amplified pretrace formula. So the amplifier, uh, you introduce an amplifier that also uh, sees the Hecke operators that are combined with certain coefficients x sub n, um, and um, maybe you want to first look at the geometric side. So on the geometric side, now the sum over gamma is not just going to be over your subgroup gamma but it's going to be over, let's say, matrices of determinant n or something similar to that, weighted with these coefficients xn. And on the spectral side, you will get a transform not just of your Archimedean test function f, but also of this uh, sequence xn. And basically, you can think about this as the non-Archimedean um, non -Archimedian test function that you're putting into your, into your uh, pretrace formula, right? So you get both of those transforms. Um, and so then the idea is to pick uh, not just f, but to pick both f and the amplifier x to additionally emphasize your chosen form phi. Uh, and what happens if, if you're successful, you will have better kind of combined localization on the spectral side. And then on the geometric side, you will get a counting problem and it involves Hecke correspondences. And these Hecke correspondences, you, you see them according to the size of this function f. So I keep repeating how you really, really have to understand the size of this function f that you're going to be seeing. Um, and so, for example, in the spherical soup norm problem, this is the setup, um, this is the classical setup. What happens with this function f is that this function f ends up concentrating close to the compact. Uh, and so what you end up needing to estimate um, is this Diophantine count. So this is where number theory really ends up entering, is that you need to estimate the number of these Hecke correspondences gamma, uh, such that the distance um, of this point that you're seeing on the screen to the compact is, is, is at most delta, right? So, you, so a, you need to count how many how many correspondences gamma have this property that by the time you apply uh, this correspondence, you land fairly close to the compact. And fairly close is controlled by some parameter delta, which could actually be as large as one, but somehow you need to be able to control this both for delta close to one and then for delta very small. All right. Uh, so the first, um, I want to kind of talk about this spherical inversion a little bit because this is really a kind of a big a big difference that happens here. Right, so uh, so when you fix this parameter L um, and you take a function f uh, in the tau L isotypical subspace, so these are these are these are functions that are um, let's say compactly supported, um, and they behave according to tau L uh, relative to the k action on both sides. So we're not going to be taking functions f that are um, that are by k invariant. That's not useful. If you take a function f that's by k invariant, you're going to pick up only the spherical forms. So we need to look at functions f that are in the tau l isotypical subspace, and that's exactly what allows us to pick up to pick up the forms that we are interested in. So for those um, for those test functions f, uh, you're going to be seeing a spherical transform that is given by this formula. Uh, really, what you're doing is you're integrating the function f of g um, against this spherical function, and this spherical function uh, I denoted by phi nu p l. So this l is the is comes from the tau l type, and this nu p comes from the representation type where you're trying to compute your spherical transform. And this function find new P L of G, that is literally like a special function. Like, like you could literally, you know, if grudstein rizik worked very hard, it would be in grudstein rizik like, like it's a special function. Um, and um, it's known as the spherical trace function. And this is how it's given. Um, so it's the, it's, the, it's the trace of what uh, happens after you apply your representation. And so you have this map that takes a function f in the tau l isotypical subspace and it sends it to this to this spherical transform f hat of nu p. And this turns out to be an isomorphism of Hilbert spaces, and there is an explicit inversion of this isomorphism. This is due to Gelfand and Neimark in 1947. It's a, it's a famous work of theirs that applies kind of more generally. But I'm talking about an isomorphism of Hilbert spaces here. All right. Now, here's the interesting twist here, is that uh, for analytical purposes, you don't want a function f that's like just some random L2 function. I mean, you need to have good control on this function f. Uh, you want this function f to decay reasonably, you want it maybe to be reasonably continuous, et cetera. So, so if you want a function f, for example, to be compactly supported and smooth on G, um, <clears throat> then this function f hat of new p uh, is not just a random 
function of new, it's an entire function of new, because of course it's, it's some sort of a transform of, uh, of a compactly supported function. I mean, just think about the Fourier transform of a CC function is going to be an entire function. And so in particular, this function f hat is going to see all of the non-unitary spectrum as well. So this function is not only defined for new on the temperate axis, it's defined on all of complex numbers. All right. Um, and so what you end up seeing here is there is this unexpected symmetry. And when I say unexpected, I'm just going to see it was unexpected to us. Um, so there is a symmetry in these spherical trace functions that the spherical trace function phi nu p l has a symmetry which relates nu p to p nu, which, which kind of like initially you're like, this makes no sense. Why would you ever switch nu and p? Uh, nu is a continuous parameter, p is a discrete parameter. Um, so this symmetry only makes sense when nu also happens to be um, uh, like a half integer, right? So nu also has to be a half integer and it has to be super far off the temperate axis. Um, all right. Um, so, so the uh, question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Christopher Lloyd, why don't you just unmute and ask away? You're muted. Uh, thank you. In in the previous integral defining f hat, you integrated over all of G, not just the compact, right? Yes. Okay. But of course, if f is compactly supported, then. It's a okay. Right. okay, so they're probably related just by a multiplicative factor, as in the as in the volume of the of the maximal torus or something. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So anyway, so there is an explanation. Like when I saw this, I kind of couldn't really accept it until I had a good explanation for this. And the explanation is that pi nu p and pi p nu, they're not isomorphic to each other, but they actually agree up to a, a small finite dimensional factor or a sub quotient. So one of them is irreducible and the other one is reducible and, and it has a small finite dimensional piece which ends up contributing nothing to the spherical trace function. And so the spherical trace functions end up having this symmetry, but you see once the spherical trace functions have the symmetry, then your spherical transform is gonna have the symmetry of any function f, right? So you're seeing this function. And, um, and so at that point, um, this kind of becomes really, really interesting because now the question of somehow, how do you go back? Uh, I mean, you can only go back from functions that satisfy this extra symmetry. Uh, and you would maybe want to ask, can I even go back for every function that satisfies this extra symmetry? And this is effectively Paley, the paley wiener problem. Like if you think about like for classical Fourier transform, there, there's a question of somehow, if I start from CC functions, what kinds of functions can I get? as a Fourier transform of that, right? And the CC infinity paley wiener problem was solved by Wang um, in actually a paper that goes back to 74. Um, and, and so the basic problem of this symmetry is that it makes it very, very hard to localize to P equal to plus minus L. We remember our, our goal in the pretrace formula is to localize to our favorite representation as much as we can. So we would like to localize to one value of P, but the problem is that if you want all the other values of P to get zeros, uh, then you're also going to have to, you, you, you get a lot of points off the tempered axis where your function has to vanish. And now all of a sudden making a function that satisfies this, um, it actually becomes very, very hard analytically. So, um, so one thing that we, that we did in our paper, and I just want to advertise this because it might be useful to other people, is that um, we eventually decided that trying to do this within the CC class uh, it, it was just very hard. We spent many months and we were not able to do it. Um, and so we ended up proving a Schwartz class paley wiener theorem. So this is a paley wiener theorem that, that classifies, if you start from uh, functions that are, that are tau L isotypical on both sides and they're smooth and have all rapidly decreasing um, derivatives, um, you want to ask what kinds of functions can you get, uh, sorry, you can ask what kinds of functions can you get as the spherical transform of this. And the answer is um, that you, you need to get functions that are rapidly decreasing in vertical strips um, and that satisfy this, this extra symmetry in addition to the analytic continuation that I already commented on. And so with this theorem, um, once we were able to prove this Schwartz class paley wiener theorem, we were able to take basically a variation on the Gaussian um, for our uh, for our spherical uh, for a spherical uh, cutoff function. So this is not exactly uh, this is not this ends up 
being not exactly uh, concentrated on p equal to plus minus l, but, but it decays very, very rapidly for other values of p. Like already for p equal to l minus one, uh, you get kind of like an exponential savings. Uh, and, and, and so these other values are not a problem for us. All right, so, so uh, the last thing I wanna talk about in terms of mathematics that we encountered is, um, is I wanna talk, sorry, I said last thing, second last thing. Um, I wanna talk about the, the concentration on the geometric side. And so if you want to understand the concentration on the, on the geometric side, uh, you need to understand the concentration of these spherical trace functions. And in fact, you need these generalized spherical trace functions where you have an extra parameter Q, which controls like which vineyard basis element you're trying to, you're trying to, to pick up. Um, and so this ends up being an analysis of, of special functions. As I said, this is like a special function that, you know, if Gretchen rigid was much thicker, it would be there, right? Uh, and so you actually have to estimate these integrals. These are like six tuple integrals and you just estimate them with a lot of stationary phase analysis. Um, and so we proved that they concentrate close to various sets. I'm just gonna tell you what kinds of sets we got because it's really interesting. Um, so some of them concentrate close to the identity matrix. Some of them concentrate close to the centralizer of A in K. And this ends up being the set of diagonal and off-diagonal matrices in K. Like it, it's, it's a union of two one-dimensional sets. Um, it can concentrate to the set of diagonal matrices in G, which is a two-dimensional variety. Um, they can concentrate close to the compact. This is similar to the, to the spherical soup norm problem. And this is a three-dimensional variety here. Um, you can concentrate to this funny set of matrices A, B, C, D, where the modulus of A and D agrees and the modulus of B and C agrees. So interestingly, this, this contains the compact K, uh, but it's actually four-dimensional. It's a four-dimensional submanifold. Um, and, and then you end up being left, uh, after the pretrace formula, you end up being left with a number theoretic problem where you're trying to count matrices where this, where this quantity G inverse gamma over root 10 G um, is close to one of these matrices. And so in the spherical soup norm problem, this was always how close are you to the compact? And here we get kind of a, a variety of different counting problems. And so because they're different counting problems, you kind of have to solve them differently, right? Um, so maybe I wanna kind of give you a, so this leads to, to, to these counting problems in C4 or C8, depending on which problem you're in. And it's intersections of you know, small balls. They can be centered randomly, not necessarily at rational points. Uh, they can be centered in thin wafers, sort of like a, like a, like a pirouette cookie, uh, or they can be, uh, oh, sorry, those are thin cylinders, or they can be in thin wafers, so sort of like a, like a, like a flat plane that's a little thickened, and of course it, it lies in a general position, so it doesn't have to be like rationally sloped or anything like that. So these are very interesting counting problems, and these are the parts of this, these supernormal problems that we really like to work on because they really have arithmetic flavor to them. Um, so maybe just to kind of, I said how these functions concentrate close to these things, and I just want to kind of show you what those estimates look like so that you understand what I'm talking about. So for example, for this, um, for this spherical function that doesn't have a parameter Q, so I'm not trying to pick just one element of the vineyard basis, um, I can take this matrix G, um, I can conjugate it to an upper triangular matrix with a compact matrix, um, and I get an estimate that looks like this on the right-hand side. Um, and so how do you read an estimate like this? Um, I don't wanna talk about the proof. I just wanna say, how do you read this estimate? Well, you say, okay, so the baseline estimate is L, but then I look at the second term and the second term tells me, well, I actually get much better than L unless Z is very close to plus minus one. Uh, and then I look at the third estimate and I say, well, I still get much better than L um, unless U is very close to zero. So I get a much better, estimate than L unless Z is close to one and U is close to zero. But if Z is close to one and U is close to zero, then my G is close to the identity. And so what this says is that this spherical function in a certain soft sense, it's concentrated, like it could be pretty pretty big close to the identity, but then otherwise uh, it starts to decay, right? Um, and then the other ones are kind of similar flavor. So I'm not gonna go into details, but like once I have a value of Q, right? Then um, I can see, for example, here, I get savings unless G is close to K, and G is close to that set of diagonal matrices in a certain uh, precise quantitative sense. Um, and again, for Q equal to zero and Q equal to plus minus L, we got uh, upper bounds in terms of distances to some, um, to some other. Um, so, so here you can see 
uh, these sets S and N, and here you can again see uh, the submanifold of all the Adam matrices. All right, so this is what those estimates look like uh, after analysis. And this, in a sense, is a lot of our hard analytic work in our paper is to prove these concentration estimates. And so in the end, I wanted to say like a couple of new features that I'm really excited about um, in this uh, line of work. So first of all, what I really like is that there's a mix of positive and negative curvature aspects. So we're really kind of, we're, we're really not throwing away the compact. We're really interested in the compact. Um, so there is a part of this picture that is positively curved and there's a part of this picture that is negatively curved. And you actually, when you're doing analysis, you start seeing both of those come together, right? Um, the other thing that I, that we didn't necessarily expect and that I think is really interesting is that the analysis of these spherical functions is highly sensitive to this parameter Q. Um, and the case when Q is plus minus L is very, very interesting. And interestingly, it is reminiscent of holomorphic forms. There's a reminiscence of what happens when you do the soup norm problem for holomorphic forms. Um, so, uh, so basically when Q is L or maybe very, very close to L, we're thinking maybe maybe about square root of L away from L, uh, you, you see basically the holomorphic form soup norm problem. And then when Q is in the bulk, when Q is not within square root of L of L, um, then, you, then your problem is much more reminiscent of the mass form soup norm problem. Um, so in this case, when Q is plus minus L, we, uh, the reason why we get much stronger estimates is that we adapt the method of Kayutin and Steiner and we write it in a, we execute it in a different way. We don't actually use the theta correspondence. We combine the Voronoi summation formula and we get essentially our hands on the, on the fourth moment um, estimate of our pointwise values. And we can only do this um, somehow in order to get our hands all the way to the fourth moment, uh, we actually have to be able to take our Hecke correspondences with n as big as the as the approximate functional equation, because we're trying to collect um, we're trying to we're trying to we're trying to collect precisely the value of phi. So we really have to go as far as the approximate functional equation goes, and so we need very very strong localization for q equal to plus minus l, so that we can take the Hecke correspondences very far, um, and so maybe. Uh, so, so I just want to say this was some, somehow interesting when I gave a talk on this um, in the Budapest conference on automorphic forms. Uh, we talked to Jack Butkane a little bit about this work, and Jack pointed out that um, actually you can um, you can bootstrap this scalar scalar form estimate. Um, so we have the scalar form soup norm estimate, which is L to one half, and you can bootstrap it to the vector vector value soup norm estimate, which is L to one, which is actually much stronger. Um, than what I previously announced here. Um, and so, so it's really interesting. This is something that was not what I had initially anticipated is that you would think that the vector valued forms are easier to, um, are easier to bound because your spectral, your spectral average is, is richer and you're trying, to, you're trying to isolate less. So it looks like this should be an easier problem. It should lead to more localization, but that's not really how it works. It turns out that these forms, when Q is plus minus L, they seem to play a very special role. And it seems like trying to estimate those is the correct way to estimate uh, also the vector value form. All right, so that was somehow uh, something unexpected and I thought uh, very interesting. Um, and finally, um, I, I was uh, maybe even my primary motivation in this work was that I realized that unlike the spherical soup norm problem, the concentration and the non-spherical supernormal problem is not just along the compact. So you get different, you get different, um, uh, different counting problems um, and you encounter new difficulties, but maybe you don't encounter some old difficulties um, along the way. And finally, I would like to say that the spherical inversion for SL2C um, uh, seems to be underutilized. I'm not seeing it used much by automorphic forms people. Um, on the level of L2 spaces, it is classical and we now have both the CC and Schwartz class uh, spherical inversion available. So this Bailey Wiener theorem of ours, I hope will be a useful tool for other people um, who would want to work on this. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention.